Yo, what's going on guys? SCJ here back with another video and today we're going to be talking about Kobe Bryant and talk about the years of his career that got wasted or have left asterisks on his career in the minds of some people. With both NBA debates going on about who's the best ever and they're continuing to ramp up due to the last dance and with all the old time rankings being talked about since there's no live sports, I felt like making this video and talking about this since Kobe's had an impact on my life as strange as that might sound because I don't know the guy and because I feel like some of the things he gets criticized for are not his fault. Anyway, with that being said, let's hop to the video and talk about the years of Kobe's career and prime that the Lakers wasted. So, let's start by going all the way back to 2004. After acquiring two legends and future Hall of Famers in Gary Payton and Carl Malone, the Lakers were looking to add their fourth title in five seasons after losing in the conference semifinals to San Antonio the season before. The Lakers had the superior talent compared to the team that they met in the 2004 NBA Finals, the Detroit Pistons, but the team sadly fell short and was dominated by the Pistons, suffering a gentleman's sweep of 4-1 in the series. There were many reasons why the Lakers lost this series, but the main ones were the fact that both Gary Payton and Carl Malone were older and past their primes. The team just never seemed to get sharpened enough and locked in, and there was still some hostility between Kobe and Shaq, despite both men simmering down the feud and tension between the two earlier in the season. When speaking on the last two things I mentioned, Kobe had this to say, they were more prepared than us, they were sharper. So it's not like the Celtics championship in 08, where we had significantly less talent than that Celtics team. Even after losing the 20 point lead or something, I still felt like we had a chance to turn things around. That Detroit series, that wasn't the case. Those dudes were sharp and we had to go deeper into our offense and we just weren't prepared. The second thing Kobe said was, I wasn't going to play with Shaq anymore after that. That just wasn't going to happen. Things he said, criticism from the media and saying I can't win without him. Look, I just put that individual aside to win championships and now I'm getting criticized for it. Now I'm going to show you what I can do on my own. So that challenge, I was going to answer that challenge no matter what. Whether I was going to stay in LA or go somewhere else, I was going to answer that challenge. So that pretty much tells you all that you need to know. And if you're watching this, then you most likely know, of course, that Shaq would end up leaving the Lakers that summer to join the Miami Heat. Carl Malone would retire, and Gary Payton left the team to join the Boston Celtics. Phil Jackson would also stop coaching the team following that season. This left Kobe with two decisions. Being that he was a free agent that summer, he could either leave and go somewhere else or stay loyal yet all alone in L.A. Kobe ended up choosing the latter of the two choices and signed a contract that is still massive and insane, but especially was with the old CBA, and he signed a huge seven-year, $136 million contract with the Lakers. That locked Kobe in with the Lakers. Sadly, the Lakers wouldn't lock him in with much talent. That following season, Kobe averaged 27.6 points, 5.9 rebounds, 6 assists, and 1.3 steals a game. The Lakers had a fall off from the previous season, which was to be expected with the departures of future Hall of Famers, but it wasn't expected to be as bad as it was. The Lakers finished with a record of 34 and 48. Aside from Lamar Odom, Karan Butler, and half a season of Chucky e. Atkins, Kobe pretty much had nothing around him. 43 games into the season, head coach Rudy Tomjanovich resigned, citing mental and physical exhaustion as his reasoning, which left the Lakers with new head coach Frank Hamblin, who made matters about 10 times worse. Hamblin went 10-29 and 29 in the final 39 games of the season, and the season just really ended up being a total mess overall. After that absolute mess that was the 04-05 season, the Lakers rehired Phil Jackson as their coach after a year away from the team. They also would trade Karan Butler to Washington for Kwame Brown and Laren Profit. In the draft, they also picked up powerful and physical center Andrew Bynum, but he ended up needing a few seasons to develop and really contribute. Due to the moves they made and the hiring of Phil Jackson, the Lakers were once again a team with a 500 plus win percentage. The team would end up facing off against MVP Steve Nash and the Phoenix Suns and they looked really, really good. That was until Game 5. The Lakers had a 3-1 series lead and ended up blowing it and eventually losing the series in 7 games. This was a tough pill for the team to swallow, especially for Kobe. Kobe had a fantastic season, and many feel he was robbed of the MVP award by Steve Nash, but we'll get into that in a little bit. 
Kobe averaged 35.4 points, 5.3 rebounds, and 4.5 assists, as well as 1.8 steals a game that season. After a rough series loss in the NBA playoffs, the Lakers turned their focus to the summer and the following season, and they would sign forward Vladimir Rodmanovich to a five-year, $31 million deal. That next season, the Lakers would once again end up being above 500 with a 42-40 record, but it was a very strange yet disappointing season for the team nevertheless. Kobe did have yet another superb season, however, averaging 31.6 points, 5.7 rebounds, 5.4 assists, and 1.4 steals a game. Smush Parker and Lamar Odom came up solid for Kobe and had big seasons, as well as Luke Walton, who averaged a career high of 11.4 points per game that season. That wasn't enough to help the Lakers, however, as they ended up losing in the first round once again and receiving a gentleman's sweep from the team they lost to the year before, the Phoenix Suns. Romanovich ended up being a huge disappointment after the Lakers signed him to a huge contract, which really stuck with the team. Thankfully for Kobe, that ended up being the last year of his career and prime the Lakers wasted as they made sure to finally get a star player around him and ended up trading for big man Pau Gasol. The Lakers would end up putting Trevor Ariza and Derek Fisher alongside Kobe as well. Now that we got the three wasted seasons out of the way, let's talk about why these three wasted seasons were so important. The first one I know I don't need to say too much about, and that's the lack of talent around Kobe and the team's failure to either qualify for the playoffs or losing in the first round. I understand it was only three years, but these are prime years of Kobe's career that he could have been fighting for an NBA championship. The second is that many people still look at Kobe as an inefficient player since he needed to shoot a lot of shots in order to win due to his teammates. People will constantly talk about his inefficiency, and he's been labeled by many as the most inefficient legend of all time. The last player with a worse shooting percentage while taking over a thousand shots was Hot Rod Hundley during the 59-60 season. So, due to the Lakers making Kobe lead a ship full of guys who all couldn't help or contribute those three seasons, it's left a huge flaw on his career. Another thing that sort of tarnished or left an asterisk on Kobe's career was the MVPs he never ended up winning because he didn't have successful enough teams or seasons. Many analysts have talked about how Kobe can't be in the top five, one of the best of all time, or ahead of certain players because of the fact that he only has one MVP award. However, while I understand why Kobe didn't get the MVP awards in multiple seasons despite having better stats, it still is a flaw that people hold against him and his career, and he really couldn't do anything about it. Let's look at a few examples of seasons where he had better stats than the player that won the MVP award that season. In 2005, Steve Nash averaged 15.5 points, 3.3 rebounds, and 11.5 assists, as well as one steal, while Kobe averaged 27.6 points, 5.9 rebounds, and 6 assists. Moving on to 2006, Steve Nash once again won the MVP award and became one of nine men at the time to win back-to-back -back MVP awards. Nash averaged 18.8 points, 4.2 rebounds, 10.5 assists, and 0.8 steals, while Kobe averaged an historic 35.4 points per game, 5.3 rebounds, 4.5 assists, and 1.8 steals to go along with his NBA scoring title for that season. And lastly, we're going to look at 2007 when Dirk Nowitzki won the award. Dirk averaged 24.6 points, 8.9 rebounds, and 3.4 steals a game. Kobe averaged 31.6 points, 5.7 rebounds, and 5.4 assists, as well as 1.4 steals. That meant that, of course, Kobe averaged more points, more assists, and more steals than Dirk that season, as well as winning the scoring title for the second year in a row. But like I said earlier, I completely understand why Kobe didn't win any of these awards. In terms of 2005, Nash averaging 15.5 points and 11.5 steals, as well as being the number one team in the league, probably shows he should have won the MVP. But nevertheless, though, Kobe might have had the better stat line overall. Plus, every NBA MVP in league history, aside from Russell Westbrook, Michael Jordan, Moses Malone twice, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Bob McAdoo, and Bob Pettit, was either a first or second seed in their respective conference. Also ironic how those three seasons I just talked about and named happened during the three years that the Lakers ended up wasting of Kobe's prime. 
So not only did the Lakers waste three prime years of Kobe Bryant's career where he could have been competing for his fourth ring at the time and what would have been his sixth ring overall, or maybe even more, but they put some asterisks and tarnishes on his career that analysts and stat nerds will forever hold against him even though he really couldn't do anything about it. Anyway though, that's going to be it for me today. I wanted to make this video to talk about Kobe and defend him against all the scrutiny or criticism he's received as of late and throughout his career and bring up valid points about why these particular criticisms aren't necessarily Kobe's fault. If you like this video, give it a like. If you want to see more basketball and NBA videos or breakdowns like this one, hit that subscribe button and I'm SCJ and I am out. Peace.